I said, empty your mind. Be formless, shapeless, like water. It's about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. Join movement expert Aaron Alexander as he dives into the minds of the foremost innovative healthcare thinkers and movement masters on their approach to optimal health and wellness. Online Podcast. Welcome back to Line Podcast. My name's Aaron Alexander. Today's beautiful episode got to have my dear friend, Miss Jill Miller, back on the podcast for... I don't know, is this the third time maybe? I hope it's the third time, something like that. Um, she's tremendous, she's the founder of Yoga Tune Up, she's the writer of The Role Model, um, she's been in the industry of movement and fitness and yoga and self-care and anatomy and physiology and fashion, all those things for over 30 years. She's been on Good Morning America, Today Show, I don't know, you could read her whole bio, but she's, she's tremendous. She's like a super valuable resource in the world of uh, embodiment, you could say. So I'm really grateful to call her a friend and grateful to get to share her message here on the podcast. This conversation goes in a lot of different interesting wormholes and um, I think you guys are going to really enjoy it. Thanks so much for tuning in to the website, aligntherapy.com, A-L-I-G-N therapy.com. You can go to alignpodcast.com as well, actually. They both go to the same place. Um, on there, you can start the five-day movement challenge. From there, you can learn some basic fundamentals on how to integrate more effective movement into your day-to-day life. Every moment can become an opportunity to move better in your body if you know the basic guidelines on how to do that. So that's what that is. Wanted to thank you all for leaving reviews on iTunes. That's super helpful. And thanks just for listening. Thanks for telling your friends. Thanks for supporting in any which way that you do. Thanks for doing you. Happy New Year. And uh, I hope you love this conversation. Check out Jill's stuff. Grab her books. Grab her yoga tune-up balls. I use them regularly. Um, She's great. I love her. I know that you guys are going to love this conversation. Enjoy Pow! Align Podcast. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Not going to interrupt a single second of that. It's a kid's song. I like it. That's like a yoga song, too, isn't it? Um, do I have this on correctly? Yeah. Okay. You're killing the game. You are killing it. All right, press record on you. Shazula. The bango. Thank you so much for doing this. Appreciate you making the time. It's so fun. It's like a fun thing. It's a good pre-Thanksgiving uh, yeah. <laughs> weekend thing. Yeah, exactly. All right. So, wait, my productivity level is at an all-time low, so it's like, oh, oh mine well, too. may as well just I podcast. feel like that's like an ongoing process <laughs> for me. How do you stay focused with writing? Oh, Jesus. Horrible question. Perfect. Yeah. (laughs) You've written some things and you write quite regularly, so. Yeah. You know, uh, social media has been a, um, like a parasite into my long form writing ability and to my concentration ability. I I feel, I truly do because, you know, I'm like, oh, that'd make a great post. And then you're just reducing and reducing and reducing, which is important for getting across thoughts. But it's long form, long form idea development is anathema to social media, uh, <laughs> social media information giving. Yeah. But it also, I think it has a helpful tool where it like helps you craft your ideas. It forces you into... Um, because that's the way people consolidate. perceive information as well, you know, so it's like, yeah, I think kind of like that, like this is something that I notice. it feels like there's like old school people that are like, you just have to read the whole thing. But the reality is the majority of people will not read the whole thing. So as far as actually impacting people, I think that being able to force yourself into that smaller container that people can actually take that digestible bite is valuable. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I mean, I don't know. I could be, that could be bullshit, but it feels like a, like a, like a cool I mean, challenge. I think they're all. I think it's all valid, yeah. and I think, but I think the the challenge, the challenge is that okay, can you scale your concepts over the course of three hundred pages now, or have you just whittled away your thought process? So you're just always an orange juice concentrate. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I want to have this, I want to have a a trough, a river of yeah. orange juice, and not just like orange yeah. juice concentrate. I think it's just. I want to have both. I yeah, guess. you think having both. Yeah. You know, so being able to actually, because it's, it's, it seems like those bite sites, 
those bite sizes is what actually leads you into creating enough interest to get, okay, I want the whole, the whole river. Yes. But sometimes if all you have is the whole stadium, it's like, okay, well, I just wanted like a corn dog. <laughs> I just, I'm, I'm, <laughs> That's I'm, a terrible you know, I'm just <laughs> bemoaning my, <clears throat> my, uh, my long form concentration, which is, I mean, it's really been impacted by having two kids. Mm -hmm. So, but I feel, I feel like I'm on the upswing right now. Like I do, I feel like I'm on the upswing and I've got some, the muse has visited and you know, that's really exciting. Yeah. How do you focus your energy because this the stuff that you write isn't just out of your head it's also like research based so that balance between doing research mm -hmm. and then writing from your heart and then mm -hmm. research and writing from your heart you know what i'm saying yeah i'm so stimulated by reading <laughs> research good and then making you know i make a lot of leaps into application so because so much of research is done on a microscopic level, especially in the, some of the, the fields that I'm interested in. And so I make these leaps in the classroom and try things out on the humans or on myself that are, you know, in, in a space. And then you, then you get to have feedback. You have interactions. You have people responding. And that you know, brings you into the emotional communicative realm. And then that helps me to, to gestate those ideas into pra into practice and into, you know, a larger, uh, you know, a larger concept of teaching. Yeah. I think the embodiment piece is something that's, uh, it's so important to be able to actually speak through embodiment and not just speak through, you know, cool. I've read every book, but I've never actually truly experienced any of like the core ideas of those. Mm -hmm. So being able to actually like go back and do the work, like you mentioned Vipassana, it's like, the whole Gwenka thing, he, a big thing that he, he kind of teaches in that is like, you need to do all this meditation before we'll give you those titrates of the actual like intellectual stimulus mm -hmm. because too much of like the intellectual kind of pontification stuff, it like, it almost pulls you out of your body. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's something that happens with, with getting too obsessed over the, the myopic parts and like learning about too much about the psoas and too much about quadratus lumborum or what at fill in the blank isolated muscle then you try and actually take that into dance or something like that. You're, it'll end up kind of making things more clunky. Mm -hmm. Experience, research, reflect. Experience, research, reflect is mm -hmm. kind of what you're describing. Or maybe you experience. You did the Instagram post of it. I, I did. did? What did I do? <laughs> you, did, you, did I do? <laughs> you isolated my information. I had like a long, unnecessary <laughs> rant. You're like, this is how you would actually put that into a post. Oh, right. Mr. Experience, Man. <laughs> reflect, research. But the reflect, research, I mean, I guess the thing is that you're, the experience is already, is already like, if you're kind of an embodiment junkie, you're going right brain, left brain, right brain, left brain throughout it anyway. But I think, I guess when you just first start experience, I mean, as a kid, you're, that you're indoctrinated into, let's say, a movement system, whether it's ballet or gymnastics or uh, martial arts or wrestling or your sport. There's no reflection, right? There's just, there's just practice. And then you hit that, that part of your life where you really want to be exceptional. And then you start to study maybe the history of that thing um, or myriads of techniques within that thing. Yeah. And then it starts to get, right, experience, Reflect research, experience reflect research. Yeah. I heard you speak about some things in relation. You had uh, a couple, few different eating disorders back in the day. A few, yeah. No, just back a few. The, back in the day. <laughs> a small handful. And we've kind of talked about this in previous episodes, but um, I'm curious your experience with like actual physical embodiment in relation to kind of forming a relationship with yourself helping you with the eating disorders. I don't think I'm asking that very well, but was there some form of like embodiment that helped with kind of coming into communion with yourself? You know, I did a podcast a few weeks ago with a girl who uh, her podcast is only about recovery Yeah. and I have never, I mean, not since therapy, like actual therapy where I'm going through stuff with a therapy. I mean, it's been a long time since I processed um, my, my anorexia or my bulimia. I mean, it was Years and years and years ago that I, I mean, it's been 20, and the last time I threw up was when I was 19, so that was, okay, can we do the math here? Oh my gosh, 28 years, years 20 ago. 29? <laughs> yeah, again, so 29 again. So it's 28 <laughs> years ago since I, uh, you know, like was in hardcore therapy about um, my eating disorders. So now all I have is decades of, of reflection and also decades of practices that continue to help me... Um, identify, I, 
identify myself, I suppose, or locate myself. But mm. that's like, okay, that's the, t that's a, a huge statement. Cause there's, there's so much to unpack there that deals with uh, visceral pain. It deals with being able to sense, um, hunger and satiation. These are all chemically mediated, hormonally mediated, um, perceptions, which is what I love about the vagus nerve. Um, which we will talk about. Which we'll talk We're about. We're probably going to start talking about it very soon. Okay, cool. Yeah, I mean, the eating, eating disorder is such a, it's such a kind of emblematic of a vagal dysregulated problem, uh, developmental problem in, in humans. Yeah. Um, so what was the question? What did he ask? What was the question kind of asked? So bridging a gap, creating, forming a relationship or like self-love through embodiment. Yes. Okay. Right. In relation to eating disorders, for example. Right. So, um, if you've listened to a podcast or two that Aaron and I have done before, I'm pretty sure I talked about, yeah. but I'll, I'll, I'll review, I'll ago. review what, yeah. what it is. So I, I started throwing up when I was 16 and I stopped throwing up when I was around 19 or 20. Um, I'm pretty sure it was 19, but, um, I had no feeling of my center. So I didn't, in fact, I was like numb there. I would, I could even scratch myself and I couldn't really feel, I could squeeze my breasts. I couldn't feel my breasts. Like I was really disassociated from my core. Um, and I would uh, hit myself also. I'd get really angry and I would, I would, I would um, punch myself in the abdomen just to try to feel. Um, Cause I was so angry at myself and really, you know, just really didn't like myself. I was a high performer. I was a high achiever. I had a lot of confidence. I could do anything, but I, I wasn't empty inside. I was filled with so many emotions. I just, it was just all shut down. Wow. So I was in the dance department and the performance department at Northwestern University, and we had uh, Pilates in the dance department. It was like an extra extracurricular you could take. And so I signed up for it and I convinced my roommate who was pre-med to also sign up for it. It was this new thing, Pilates. Like this is, I'm talking about 1990, 1989 or 90. Yeah. They were doing Pilates and um, on the mat. And they didn't have yoga mats back then, by the way. We had to buy this, like, it was like this special mat that we bought. And my teacher was, it was wanting made to... Out of wood. <laughs> it was made like out all of good wood. Things. That's right, cork. <laughs> like, we had to go out and shave our trees down. So Juanita Lopez was the um, instructor, and she was a Joffrey ballerina, and she had studied directly with uh, Ramana, who was one of Pilates' uh, top. So anyway, I had, a, I mean, like, I had the best of the best instructors, but I never got sore. Like, I, my core never got sore, and Bita would be just moaning, and she'd be in pain and I was like I don't know why you're why this hurts you so much but it's because I was bypassing my abdomen I actually did couldn't create um intra-abdominal tension I couldn't really contract well I was just using my arms and my limbs and just sort of muscling my way around it um and I told that was like one of the indicators I was like I should be more sore from this not that because I wasn't really strong um, and I was doing yoga on the side. I was doing Shivananda yoga, which is like uber stretchy, hold poses for a really long time. It's like the, one of the ultimate static, um, static yoga uh, uh, systems, I suppose, that there is. And then I went to an Iyengar class somehow. I had all this free time. I don't know how it's a full-time student. I did all this stuff. I went to a, a yoga class in Chicago, and I mentioned to the teacher that I, um, that I couldn't feel my abs and that I was bulimic. And... This is when I, I started telling people because I was looking for help. Right. And she suggested that I lay down on, uh, it looked like a hamburger bun, but it was a sand-filled bean bag, the shape of a hamburger bun. And actually in the Iyengar tradition, it was used as a kind of a, a head pillow for a headstand. It was right. like an extra little like cushion that you could put your head on for headstand, I think. But she told me to lay face down and, on it and breathe into my abdomen. And so when I laid down on it, I felt so much pain in my body. Um, and the, just this achy, gnarly, um, dull and sharp combination that was untenable. Um, but really it was the voice of my viscera talking to me through that that pressure application. And that was the first taste of the, the abuse that I had been doing with this retching, right? With, with the, this changing the, the normal course of digestion and 
um, and messing with my autonomic nervous system in that way, right? So this this was a, a really great uh, way for me to test the waters or to, to sense the waters of the discord that I was just bl like just running away from all the time. Yeah. And so then I replicated it in my, I knew that I was like, okay, something, there's something powerful here. At the same time, I also was, um, I had just started to study shiatsu massage or I was, I was involved in a shiatsu community. And I, I actually don't know which came first, whether it was the shiatsu or whether it was laying on the thing. Um, but in the type of shiatsu that we did, um, sh shiatsu, by the way, is a Japanese medical um, a, a Japanese medical theory. So it's really, it's the meridian theory of the body, just like Chinese medicine. There's a little bit of difference in the Japanese medical model, but it's meridian theory, right? So your organs and the rhythm of your organs are, uh, they have these meridians, right? These lines that they govern throughout the body. You can touch different points and you can affect organs or you can touch the organs and affect different points in the lines. Yeah. Um, which, you know, fast forward 30 years later, I'm working with Tom Myers on a project right now where he has a myofascial meridian theory, right? The anatomy trains, which is like one of the, the most popular meridian theory models that we have now in the West. But uh, Chinese, and Chinese and Japanese and also um, um, uh, Indian, there's uh, lots of different, Tibetan, there's lots of different models that follow these channels, energetic channels, slightly different from each, from one to one. So anyway... Um, in the Japanese uh, form of shiatsu, there's this technique called mother hand. And in mother hand, the, you always put a palm on the abdomen while you're working the rest of the body. So this is a form of massage where you're, you're doing this on the ground, you're doing it on futons, and uh, you wear a gi. Um, but that was one of the other impressions I had of uh, utilizing therapeutic touch into my abdomen for well-being and for transformation and for change, is when I felt my teacher's palm rest on my abdomen, I felt a sense of not discord, but harmony. Hmm. So when I laid on the ball, I felt all my shit. When I had a, a human's palm antenna um, resting on my navel, my hara, the center of being, according to the Japanese model, I had this feeling of, of, of peace, of merging, of union, of quiet of completeness that I'd never felt before. So I was seeking that sensation. Um, and so I would roll up a towel, a hand towel, and bend it into what, what now looked like a Cinnabon instead of a hamburger bun uh, or a honey bun. I'm from the South. We used to eat honey buns. And I would lay on it in my dorm room for many minutes. Every morning I would start with it. Uh, maybe right below my diaphragm and then migrate it to my navel and then migrate it right above my pubic bone. Every single morning I would do that for, I don't know, maybe seven minutes. And then I would start my, my little asana practice. Mm. Um, but that was my way, that was my way in to changing that disconnect and re-embodying myself. And now 20 something years later, I have a, a, a product called the Gorgeous Ball that is specifically about this in this internal attunement that gives you insight into your respiratory mechanics, uh, your visceral state, um, and also the myofascial structures, the muscle structures that, that surround your trunk and are responsible for posture, breathing, and lots of other things. Yeah. I wonder how many people actually really feel like homeostasis or balance or any of those terms really completely throughout their viscera and their enteric nervous system. Or, like, I feel like having tension, you know, it's called, Moshe Feldenkrais called it parasitic tension. You know, so having any kind of unnecessary tension that you're holding or bracing continually throughout the day, you just don't realize it. I, I clench my, you know, fill in the blank sphincter all day long. And then every once in a while, once a, you know, a month, I have an orgasm or something like that. And I like feel completely relaxed for a second. But the rest of them <laughs> back up into this parasitic tension. Uh huh. You know, it's like that, that journey of actually like exploring and seeing like where the hell is the parasitic tension in the first place? You know, it's just, uh, is, do you have any sense of like how to, how to locate these parasites? 
these if that's an okay, if that's psychic, an okay metaphor, psychic tensional parasites, psychic parasites, right? Right. Psychic yeah. parasites. Do you? Uh, well, you I mean, that is something that to, to definitely look for. Is maybe I mean, like if you have chronic irritation in your guts, it is good to get a GI workup yeah. and to find out if there's parasites and to find oh, out yeah, if you're right, allergic to you know gluten or yeast or whatever. Because actually, that is going to cause so much discord in right. the different mucosal linings. And I mean, there's so many things it could be, but if you've ruled out all that stuff, yeah. <laughs> you know, and you got to look for parasites for sure. I mean, I, I had a whole workup. I was but like, the parasite, please let it be something but the else other than my, my, my emotional pain that's, that's turning me into knots on the inside. Please yeah. let it be something that I can take a pill and it will kill. So that was, so that was the parasitic tension that he's referring to is, is Oh, Selden Christ said that? Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I love so, so, th- so that was, so that was, um. Um, no, I just made it up. I'm joking. Oh. Uh, no, I'm serious. <laughs> <laughs> and now I don't know what to believe. <laughs> <laughs> Look it up. Bears of attention. <laughs> Moshe Feldenkrais or Moshe or Moshe. how do you pronounce his name? Moshe. Whatever. I think it's Whatever. Moshe, actually. Whatever. He's Russian. Moshe. Moshe. I always called him Moshe. I just stick with it. Um, yeah, so, so essentially the, the, the meaning around that is that if you have this, this bracing and fill in the blank place, like so many, so, so, you know, you obviously know that I, I, you know, do body work and such. So sometimes you'll pick somebody's leg up or their arm up or whatever. And they're like, Ugh, their arms just like sitting there like, oh, like you have no idea how to relax. Like you don't have that in your, in your system. You're just in this kind of statue state, various different forms of statue. And so what he's referring to in that is if you can't completely relax and downregulate and like calm and rest, digest and heal and all that stuff. That tension that you have, it's literally leaching energy from your body. Like your feet, it's like you leave your house and you leave all the lights on. You leave the mm-hmm. stove on and then you come back and your electricity <laughs> bills like through the roof. You're like, what the hell is going on? It's like that parasitic tension. That's burned out. Yeah. Yeah. So figuring out like, you know, first figuring out, okay, do I have some of this, this unnecessary tension throughout my body? How do I locate that? And then how do I address it? Yes. I mean, th- that's what I, I, I guess I spend a, a lot of my time investigating and teaching and um, with the role model, with the role model method and also with yoga tune up. So one of the things that I like to say is that you become familiar with the texture of your tension. Hmm. You know, tension is you know, our different, different tissues have different textures and they have natural inherent tensions due to their, the, the fibers that they're created from, the collagen and elastin, um, due to your genetic composition, um, due to em- emotional tension or the or the the, the need for environmental um, uh, alertness, right? Depending on the different environment that you're in. Yeah. So when but when I teach, what I hope to do is break down, help you create. An, first of all, I create an environment and go into spaces where we can create a mental framework where you can let as, as much of your guard down as possible so that you can completely enter into a dominant parasympathetic state where you're in a safe place to have that experience of parasympathetic dominance. Um, for, I think for many of us, it's never fully safe to, to let your guard completely down. Right. Right. And Or the illusion is that it's never safe. The story that you have subconsciously is that it's never safe. Right. In fact, maybe it's completely safe right. or maybe not. Sorry. I interrupted. <laughs> yeah, no, but that's, that's, that's the, ch- that's the challenge. I mean, especially in the last few weeks, I mean, there was a, a gunman that went into a yoga studio yeah. and shot two women and then killed himself. So the illusion of safety is, um, is an illusion right now. I mean, there's a lot of fear in all of our bodies. I've been hyper, hyper aroused for the last, um, especially the past two weeks after the the shooting in Thousand Oaks and then the fires that followed immediately. You know, it's so close to home, the shooting in Pittsburgh. My sibling used to teach at that synagogue. You know, the ripples of our, of the discord of, of available violence in our society, you know, that goes into, um, a place of hypervigilance, it, 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 it shuts down our ability to have calm digestion. Like our vagus nerve uh, needs to feel safe in order to conduct motility efficiently. Mm. Um, I think we're going to see, I mean, there already is a spike in anxiety disorders across the culture in the past few years, and I think it's just going to continue to escalate. So what are the things that we can mediate on our own um, to 
act as a salve because I don't think we have a solution culturally right now. So what we need to do is continue to stimulate our own parasympathetic response so that our resiliency score is more balanced and that we're not on the side of this um, more of a, of a fight or flight or a freeze state in terms of our um, autonomic nervous system. Yeah. You know, so we have to do something um, to to buoy to buoy that stress. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah, there was a story that I heard from Teet Not Han, pronouncing his name probably wrong as well <laughs> as I did Moshe 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 <laughs> Teet Not Han, right? Um, so anyways, so they're, they're that's like, pretty good. They're I can't <laughs> do much better. I don't fine. speak Vietnamese. That's, that's fine. So, anyways, <laughs> so they're getting on, they're getting, there's like all these people and they're like refugees or whatever the, you know, whatever the, the terminology, they're all getting on this boat, they're cramming this boat and they're all panicking from Vietnam. I don't know the specific details of it. It's just a story that I got that the, 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 the meaning of it is, is the important part and everybody's panicking and freaking out. And then one of the things that he, he, he mentioned was that all it took was, was one person to really feel grounded and feel safe and feel like they have it. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, okay. There's like that yeah, anchor point. There's that emotional contagion element, yeah. right? That uh, Mirror neurons. Uh, well, yeah. V.S. <laughs> VS Ramachandran talks about empathy neurons too. Right. So it's not just mirror neuron like you're, you know, like you saw, you know, my daughter lay down and then Asher, my son, mimicked her. Yeah. But these empathy neurons where we're actually mimicking each other's state and mm -hmm. we, entrain, we entrain with each other's state. And it's pretty powerful. Like, um, that's a lot of the, uh, the research in um, psychotherapy. I just went to a body-centered psychotherapy conference a few weeks ago called the USABP, United States Association of Body Psychotherapy. And one of the plenary speakers was Dr. Alan Shore. And all of his work is around um, co-regulation of the, the dyad that happens in the therapeutic exchange and how important it is for... Um, the therapist to really be in a sense of, you know, in, embodied and aware of what their, you know, really what their energy is um, putting out and contributing to the, the dialectic that's going on between the, um, um, the, con the, the patient as in, in that exchange, but also to be aware of what triggers the therapist is experiencing because the therapist has to enter into a very right brain space um, to help with the emotional regulation of the client. It's really interesting and complicated and it gives me so much more respect for for you know therapists that are like working on that edge of not just being like clinical and evaluative, but allowing themselves to go into this right brain space to try to host, yeah. uh, to help that the person regress to the degree that they can then repair, right? Because so many of our wounds are from the you know from deep in the past and they're showing up in the present, but you you do have to kind of regress to this this place, a very, uh, this unpleasant place, and then, you know, titrate your way into um, these little moments of, of repair. So he's, he's just, just astonishing what, how he was talking about the, the skill of being in that right brain state. Mm -hmm. What, what precipitated, what, 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 Oh, I don't ignited know. that. We're just getting all empathetically neuroned or whatever. Oh, oh, so right. So exactly. <laughs> so it was about the empathy neurons <laughs> and how can, and, and, and it is like a contagion. Um, <laughs> and, and that's, that's another reason to do, you know, to do your self work so that you're not just one more, you know, bent out of shape or hysterical person. Like I get really triggered. Like I was not easy to be around in the last few weeks. I was deeply, deeply, um, affected by, by all the stuff. And then I got to get on a plane and go to the fascia Congress, which totally uplifted me. And I got to be in my community. I extracted myself from the stresses of, of, um, of here, you know, yeah. and, um, got to have an extreme, extreme, um, extremely positive disruption into my, you know, and I brought it back. Like I feel amazing. I'm sleeping gobs. It feels amazing. And, yeah, you cool. know, loving being around my, my family again. Whereas before you were like, Oh my God, I'm ruining my kids because I'm so depressed and anxious. And 
Yeah, there's a book called uh, The Master and His Emissary. Have you ever heard of that one? Yeah, I, it's written. I have it right here. I'm supposed to read <laughs> it. Like all I the... cheated. I saw it written down. No, Are you I didn't. serious? No, I didn't. You looked at my um, notes. No, no, no. I would love to, though. I would love to get, get your notes. Um, <laughs> so, But anyway, so that, that book, you already know about it, but people listening uh, probably do as well because I've talked about it before. Um, but essentially, it's like you're mentioning like the whole right hemisphere, kind of like the creative outside of the box, throw colors at the wall, empathy, you know, all that stuff. Um, and, and there's way better explanations than that, I'm sure. But um, that side more easily gets trumped by the analytical left hemisphere, kind of like inside the box, get shit done, you know, run the numbers, crunch the whatever. And so it's like... Uh, Culturally, I feel as though there's kind of like it feels almost like the 70s, which I wasn't involved in, or the 60s. Um, so <laughs> trust me, you're such a throwback. Trust, trust me on this. But it feels throwback. it feels like we're, it feels like there's kind of like this re re kind of like a revolution. Yeah. Of that like that that right hemisphere. Yeah. Is what it feels like to me. I also live in a bunch of bubbles. Yeah. Um, but that attunement and that yeah. connection and that empathy and all that, it feels like it's like it's like getting to be sexy again. <laughs> totally. No, I, 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 I totally agree at the same time that the Me Too movement um, has shown up. And so there's all this new awareness of boundaries and power structures. Right. So it's like a, a, a like a ri- maybe a richer, more a- appropriate 70s or yeah. you know maybe a more well boundaried 70s in right. some ways. Yeah. Um, but I mean, for me, like I, I, I had a I had a total hip replacement a year ago and so much of the relearning because for me of relearning to walk, you can't learn to walk in a left brain state. You have to learn to walk in a right brain state. It's all, um, reactive and automatic and you can't think it, you can't think your way through a step. Right. You're, you go from your heel to your toe in in a third of a second. You can't learning to walk can sometimes throw the whole thing off. In a sense, if you're thinking about all this, like you're just thinking about, okay, the toe and the knee and the hip and the, and the contralateral motion and the, yeah, you're like, oh God, I'm like a robot. Yeah. It, yeah, totally. So like that was when, when, when I realized that I was going to have to go and live in that right brain, brain space and that it was okay to not know things anymore. That was a really wonderful thing for me to do because I'm an, I'm an, originally I'm like an artist and a dancer and a singer. And so I'm, as a kid, I was just like imagining I was all these people all the time. Like I'd see a movie and I would be that person for four days. My parents were like, what's going on with her? Yeah. You know, I would just been, be in my imagination space. And so to have the permission to go there and be there and know that I was okay there in that retraining that, that place, um, I just treasure that because so much of my life is decision making and organizing and time and scheduling, Mm -hmm. but to, to inhabit that. And it's just so important for well-being. Hmm. You mentioned motility in Vegas. Can you mention, can you, we get into a little bit of what that is? Cause we, I was, I was, I didn't want to interrupt cause I was interested in what you're saying, but those are words that I'm, I'm sure even people that do know it'd be good to get into like what the hell that is like motility of the, of the organs and the value of, and the different branches of the vagus nerve. I would love to like explore that a little bit. Um, do you want to talk about Dr. Porges's work yeah. about polyvagal theory? Yeah, please. All right. So it's like, I need a chart here. Yeah. Um, so Dr. Stephen Porges is, a. um, He's a researcher. He's a neuro, I think he's a neurophysiologist. I hope I'm right. I might be wrong with, I mean, he's like got lots of titles. Yeah. Uh, he's currently at the Kinsey Institute in Indiana and he's there. He was at North Carolina, I think UNC Chapel Hill for a really long time, but he's at Kinsey cause that's where his wife is. His wife runs the Kinsey Institute, um, at Indiana university, which is the sex, the sex Institute. So she's a specialist in, um, oxytocin. Mm. Yeah, very cool. cool. And he is a, uh, he has been studying the vagus nerve for decades. He is the first person to actually quantify heart rate variability um, and has an understanding of respiratory sinus arrhythmia, the actual beat to beat, you know, changes in the heart rate in ways that are, um, you know, can never really be captured on an app. Hmm. This is what he understands about the neurophysiology and the governing of the heart came primarily out of his studies with neonatal infants, with preterm infants. And um, what he came to discover through um, the decades of research is that 
Um, the vagus nerve is a, it's a really strange nerve because it has, um, uh, it originates in your brain and it has a dorsal root and a ventral root. So it has shoots that go forward and it has shoots that go backwards. And those become important in a moment when I explain the evolution of the vagus nerve. It also has shoots that descend down and enervate your, uh, your heart, uh, as well as certain sensory uh, afferents into your lungs. The vagus also has some sensory afferents that uh, touch into the diaphragm, but then it plunges um, into th beyond the diaphragm and down into your viscera. And 80% uh, of its nerve fibers in your viscera, or 80 to 90% of those nerve fibers, are actually sensory, and only 10% are efferent, meaning 10% of the vagus's output is about muscle contraction, and or 10 to 20, and then at 80 to um, 80 to 90 is about um, relaying or surveying the okayness of your organs and feeding, giving that feedback to the brain. Mm. Um, so, your vagus, uh, one of its primary things in terms of heart rate variability is it's the brake on the heart. So every time you, every, actually every time you inhale, your heart rate actually speeds up and there's lots of um, uh, chemical processes that are involved with your body sensing its own um, oxygen saturation satiation and then the impulse to, to, to continue breathing is cut off, um, at which point the vagus becomes uh, very active and it slows down your heart rate. So when you breathe in, your heart rate um, speeds up about 20% and when you exhale, it slows down. And if you're uh, kind of an interoception junkie, so interoception is the is subtle physiological listening. It's a, it's a term you probably need to know right now because I'm about to get more into <laughs> polyvagal theory, but interoception is your ability to sense things like the movement of air, the movement of fluids in your body, your heart, your own pulse, um, movement tied, of organs. It's tied to your sensation of time as well, apparently. I, I read, I think in the... I think they're going to keep discovering all the things. There's, it's tied to so many things. Your perception of um, lust is is an interoceptive um, feedback loop also. I heard specifically um, that uh, the same portions of the brain that, that can sense time, like if we say, if we start a timer right now, we say, okay, like one minute, and you're like, tell me after a minute. Um, oh. You know, when it hits that point, and we start the timer, and the same thing we just keep on talking about, you know, porges balls or whatever. Um, that's an inside thing, I guess, anyway. The gorgeous ball, porges ball. Um, and then if you're the closer that you're able to tell when it's a minute, apparently that's like the more kind of activated you are in that aspect of your brain that can also feel into like internal sensations. Interesting. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, I'll have to Anyways. look that up. I've got, I've got a couple of different interoception tests, but okay. I haven't come across that <laughs> one, so. I'm really intrigued by that. Yeah. Um, Sorry, I interrupt. I, but I, I actually, I have a, a, a dance that I teach, which is, it's a five minute dance where you, it's, I learned it from when I was learning Bouteau. And you start with one hand is in a fist and the other palm is open. And then the dance is you press a timer and then in the course of five minutes, you just switch hands. Mm. And so uh, when I teach it, most people, they, they just, the, that slow motionness, it makes sense to me a little bit that that's uh, interoception. But wow. but in this in this case, there's a proprioceptive element because your your eyes are closed and yeah. you're opening one hand while you're closing the other. Anyway, that's a whole that's a total yeah, rabbit a hole. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's a great meditation. It's one of my favorite things to right. do. Um, I like that just the value. And then this last time I interrupt you, probably not. But I I I, I like. That's why I need to chart. I know <laughs> the bullet points. <laughs> I just I think it's a cool thing to kind of ponder on that this. It's a, it's a it's a muscle you know we get so activated on on getting the buys and the tries and like this abs and all that stuff that but there's a whole you mean that perception is a muscle is that what you yeah. mean like yeah like, like in, inter in inter air quotes yeah muscle in air right, quotes okay, great, you know great, it's something yeah. that you can actually strengthen and cultivate yeah, you can go deep into that but the here's the kicker okay. is if you are too <laughs> into so now i'm raising my hand because this is now what i was like because i was all into embodiment and right. feeling but there's this thing called called too much. Right. There's a thing called moderation. <laughs> I've heard of this. I've heard of that. <laughs> There's a thing called, and so then I started, as I was digging deeper into interoception, I was like, oh, people who are highly interoceptive are more prone to panic attacks and eating disorders. Oh, and I was like, oh, that's me. Oh, interesting. Because it's like, if you feel 
every single time your heart beats, right. it drives you friggin' bonkers. Mm. So I have an, an incredibly high interoception score, which is not good. Cause you know what these things, that's why you have an autonomic nervous system. It happens automatically. You don't need to monitor it, mm. but if your monitor is sensitized as mine is, it is, it's, it's grueling. It's like having 15 extra voices. Yeah. You don't need, I don't need the committee. I actually don't need the committee. So my body talks to me a lot. I mean, it's, so it's my gift and it's my curse, I would say. Almost well, like X-Men. Like you have to learn how to, <laughs> this is high level, high level, yeah, high brow, high brow stuff here. Bring it into the. Because <laughs> you grow up and you're like gray who has like psychic powers or whatever. Wolverine who has super healing. And at first it sucks because you're different. And you're like, oh, God, everybody wants to kill me, and this is strange, and like I have their voices, and I'm freaking out. Um, and then if you can learn how to, how to cultivate that and contain that, then it's like it's a legitimate superpower, I think. Is your hand going to go back up? <laughs> no, I, I, ag- I agree. I mean, I, 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 I am on my path. Like, I know that I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, and, um, and that, that, you know, the awareness of the sort of pathological interoception that I have is, it's interesting. And so it's like, okay, I got to work with that. Yeah. Right. Um, I don't like to say the word path- pathological. Dr. Porges will call it adaptive. Mm. He will call it adaptive. It's an adaptive response because of how that vagus was, um, uh, the type of exposure, the developmental exposure that it had in early, early childhood years. Yeah. Um, so, Back to the Vegas. Yeah, please. And um, so we had to go on the sidetrack of interoception yep. in order to get where we're going. <laughs> so you've got, you've, got, you've got a subdiaphragmatic Vegas that is really ancient. And we, we share this with, other, with reptiles and we share it with um, you know, m- other mammals. And then we have this sort of uh, thor- cardiac plexus vagus that helps our heart to regulate its, um, its pace, its pacemaker. Um, and then humans have the humans have this extraordinarily new vagus, which is what's called the ventral vagus. So the ventral vagus is, uh, myelinated, unlike the subdiaphragmatic vagus. The subdiaphragmatic mega- vagus is, is, is unmyelinated, so these are slow-moving signals. But in the case of the um, ventral vagus, these are um, fast-moving. Oh, so the ventral uh, also shoots down to the heart. So the ventral vagus um, it shares source nuclei with, oh, God, I, I always forget all the nerves, but five other facial nerves. Yeah. And these nerves are your, your uh, innervate the muscles of expression, including the muscles around your eyes, the muscles around your mouth, muscles that attune your, um, your inner ear, um, and the muscles of your vocal production. So they're the muscles of suck, swallow, chew, uh, breathe, and these all need to be coordinated well in your early infancy with your caretaker, primary caretaker, which is probably your mother or whoever other that primary caretaker is. So these are the muscles of social interaction and um, co-regulation, your ability to um, locate state in another person and then mirror that, (laughs) back to V.S. Ramachandran, uh, mirror that in a body. And I guess there's a researcher also named Peter Fonagy who's done a lot of of work around around that, around facial expressivity and that uh, that back and forth between the mother and the infant and what that and what that means. It's like you're tuning their cranial nerves through that facial affect. Yes. In a sense. Mm -hmm. Right. You say that. Sure. Yeah. I would say showing showing that that empathy and that connection and expression. It's yeah. like almost like you're 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 uploading that into the into the child. Maybe I don't know. Yeah, or you're up, reflecting it back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Yeah. And so you go through these amazing emotional uh, this emotional discourse because this is pre language, mm-hmm. right? So the mother the mother's face is always conveying to the child oh, and it still is safety. Yeah, we're still pre verbal. Yeah, we are still pre verbal. We just have this like big top hat of verbal 
stuff. And this is but that really, right brain like, place. This goes to that, that sort of right brain conditioning. Yeah. Um, they say 7% of our communication is via verbal. That was like some Harvard study in like the 60s or something like well, that. Well, it's not a lot. It's not a lot. Jeez. It was 50, 50 I think it was, I got to relook it up. Um, 58%, I believe, was through body language. And I think 35 or something percent was, was tonality. And then the last part was, was the, the language part. It's probably different if you're like talking on the phone. When we're communicating, like, right. if, so if someone like looks away, their hips change, they nod their head as they're saying yes, you're just like, I don't believe it. Like it's, that 7% is just, mm -hmm. I'm way falling the 58% yep. or the 38 tone. Yeah. And then poor just gets into tonalities being such a big thing too. Oh, huge. So the vocal, the vocalization is so much, I mean, he, he's just done so much research, but now he's actually made a product around, um, around, uh, uh, uh around tones yeah. for autistic children. Um, so the spec, the sort of the hearing spectrum that we see, what we developed is an ability to have high pitched sounds that couldn't be detected by predators. So we developed a, a vocal frequency that ha was more melodic mm. and could, um, could get us out of danger. We can scream, whereas a, a I guess a, a dinosaur <laughs> or a reptile, um, their middle ear bones aren't detached, and so they don't have, they can't actually have their eardrums vibrate the way we do. I mm. can't remember the name of the muscle that controls the uh, eardrum. I have it written in my notes S over here, but oh, I don't know. Yeah, no, I, I, I almost I'm, no. So right. somebody listening or what's in the, the future, what's the bone? The stapes? Oh gosh. Uh, I don't got. I don't have all my stapes. It's the smallest bone I think in your body. The stapes. Sta Little tiny. Stapes. 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 I think it's called the stapes. I'm gonna stick with that. Um, <laughs> I did know it at one point. My uh, that file. I don't know where that file is. That's okay. Okay, so. You have lots of other great files here. So the so vocalization is really important, and he likes to talk about mother ease as being the ideal way to. Um, to help up upregulate somebody's vagal tone, so you upregulate somebody's vagal tone by speaking in mother ease to them. Yeah. For so, and he likes to say, women are very good with mother ease because they're used to talking to babies. Men are very good with it when they're talking to their dogs. Mm. Right. So if you listen to a man talk to a dog, he'll actually automatically go into that melodic way of talking yeah, to the dog. Right. Um, actually on a more intuitively than they will with their own children, which I was like, Oh, that's interesting. Huh. Um, but men naturally have a lower frequency in their voice and women naturally have a more melodic just because of, you know, sex hormones and how our larynx is positioned in our body. Mm. So women have an advantage there. And that's by obviously by billions of years of evolution have, have helped that to be. So, um, so the, that gives you a little bit of the anatomy and where, where the, where the vagus gets to what it gets to innervate. But what he's talking about with the polyvagal theory is that we start to develop, uh, symptoms when our vagus is recruited as a system of defense, yeah. uh, inappropriately recruited as a system of defense. And so, um, the the typical understanding of the autonomic nervous system is that we have a sympathetic and a parasympathetic. We have our rest and digest and recover, and then we have our fight or flight. But there's also a heightened... So the parasympathetic actually has two states of behavior. One is that rest, digest, recover. Um, and the other is a state of immobilization or freeze. Uh, and that is a state that happens when you, you death vein, when you pass out, yeah. or when you are immobilized by fear. It is, an, it is not a volitional state. It happens automatically. Um, you are in a car accident and you shit your pants. Like you didn't do that on purpose. That was your vagus going overactive and stimulating those smooth muscles of your digestive tract to help you void. Mm. Um, uh, this happens in uh, situations of, ab of abuse where, you know, in interpersonal abuse or rape um, or, uh, or just day-to-day -day violence. I can't even, day-to-day -day violence, I can't even saying that. But I can't imagine what, what um, conditions were like in 
in the, in the club in Thousand Oaks when that shooter was there, like, people paralyzed in fear yeah. that wasn't their choice that was their body's vagus nerve going on hyper parasympathetic state and um, putting them into an immobilized state just the same way a cat eating a you know catching a mouse the mouse will look like it's paralyzed yeah, but it's, it's not dead it's the last resort it's lowering its metabolic demands to conserve energy also so that it won't feel pain and maybe because as like a defense mechanism. It, it's the ultimate defense because, mechanism. Because, oh, you're dead. Like, okay, I'm not that I'm not, right. Um, but what happens is that the, ma- the mouse, dozen minutes later, will be able to like shake its way back. Yeah. The That's human, what we don't do. our nervous system is less resilient because we have this cortex and we, then we make up all these stories about, oh, I, I should have run. I should have fled. I should have left. Um, and so when the, the vagus is, is, co-opted for defense when it doesn't need to be, um, or that becomes a way of the body, um, the, the body's way of adapting to scary situations or even just the headline news and you start to get rumbles in your stomach. Um, you know, this is, this is where we have sort of a maladaptive, um, or pathologies that start to spring up around, around the vagus's health. And so ways to improve its health are to then stimulate the thoracic zone and the with the facial zone. So to stimulate the supradiaphragmatic vagus through doing different exercises. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of self massage. I'm a big fan of breathing exercises. I'm a big fan of, of singing and especially massaging, uh, muscles of the face, neck and head. I use the therapy balls in different ways to, um, stimulate the, the sort of ventral vagus complex as ways of subduing the desire for my subdiaphragmatic vagus to, to, to freak out. Mm. Right. Yeah. And the healing powers of the vagus nerve, that book that, that, um, I think you might've turned me on to Stanley it. Rosenberg. Yeah. So good. Um, you, you read this. Yes. I haven't read it. I've just oh. read parts of it oh, man. and you, I've listened to interview. It. Oh my God. I know. It's, yeah. I look, you should see the stack of books. <laughs> That I'm spo- that I'm well, so, right in, so yeah. in that one, one of the things that he mentioned is like the exercises to see what the what the state of somebody's their you know their vagal tonicity, whether they're more ventrally activated or dorsally or what have you, um, was was trap engagement because that's tied to I forget which cranial nerve. Um, uh, but okay. I, won- I wonder with, with that. And the other thing is like looking into like the the throat muscles. I think it's called the upper glottis. I think the, the muscles uh, yeah, around yeah, the, the, the uvula. uvula. Uh huh. Yeah. And so when you if you open your mouth, ah 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 ah, they should innervate, activate equally. And if uh-huh. they don't, then that's an indication that uh-huh. that, that, that that relationship to the, the cranial nerves are kind of like wonked. Wonked. Uh huh. <laughs> it's interesting how we can kind of look and and see. Like we look around, we're just like, oh, I got tight traps. It's like you know, it's a, such a common thing. But I think a lot of us are actually experiencing this really deleterious state of our nervous system that's actually, you know, maybe like killing us if you want to be really dramatic. No, um, I think it's whittling away our resilience. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I do. And, and one, of the, one of the tests for it is if you're um, a singer and you go through your scales and you're unable to hit your high notes anymore, you're able to, to get into your head voice, <laughs> to get into your high head voice, um, the high, you can't get into your high head voice unless you're... Um, the, the muscles are appropriately relaxed yeah. in your throat. Um, and so if they're on tension, that means you're, you know, you're using, so you're defended in that sort of cranial region right. and you're going to just be off pitch all the time. I have a, 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 a vocalist in Kansas getting her master's degree on, Repair, uh, regenerative strategies for vocalists and she took my breath and bliss immersion a few months ago and you know we do all sorts of different pressure vectors with the cordis ball breathing strategies different different ways of um, uh, improving torso control of the respiratory diaphragm and then the relaxation response in the vocal production center. So that's the, the, with, with singers, you have to be extremely powerful in your core, but completely able to let go in your, your jaw, your neck, Mm -hmm. your head to get, to affect different positions with your jaw to create different notes. And, and then you use your right brain to imagine yourself in these high, high note spaces to get the resonance. It's really a, singing is a really amazing art. It was my first art form. Um, and 
<laughs> not like no one's gonna hire me to sing, but like I just love singing. <laughs> no, we heard that was legit. I'm just joking. <laughs> when you did that, when I did when that, did when I thing. sang the kids song. So, which is totally <laughs> oh, like the we, kids singing. We do is, have the kids song actually. That's great. So, the uh, kid, hopefully, I include that. The kids singing is the ultimate like prosodic feature that that Poor just talks about as being vaguely regulating. So, anyway, back to getting to the high note. So. She's doing, she's using the gorgeous ball in her study. She's going to do a, a, like, she's going to produce a study, a research study on this, which I'm so excited about because it's such a niche in performance. Like everybody talks, everybody uses their voice, unless you don't, if you're, I mean, if you have a, a, and you know, some, some people don't, but the majority of humans, we speak, right? You mime. Um, uh, I mean, even, even folks who are deaf, they use their, you know, they use sounds and they use their, their use, uh, their vocal production to produce sound. So her professor hadn't warmed up yet and she just did the some of the, the ball work on the gorgeous ball and then just tried to hit a high F and she nailed it. And she never in her entire wow. life has ever been able to hit a high F without a proper vocal warm up that takes many, many minutes. But she did it without any vocal warm up. And so what this is telling me is I don't yet have a study that can show you the different mechanical places for you to stimulate your vagus nerve. Because what they're doing is electronic medicine right now. You can like get an implant or you can run, you know, uh, run a vibratory thing over your vagus nerve and uh, in the side of your neck and, you know, do all sorts of things that are um, electronically based. But I'm not really an electronics person. I'm really a, you know, a soft tissue and a roll, you know, roll around and massage each other or massage yourself type of person. Yeah. I don't want to have... Um, I want to have as few sensors near my body as possible. So the fact that she just did this f- from just, you know, pressure, a tool and breathing and was able to change the behavior of her voice, which is vaguely mediated to me is just amazing. So I can't wait to see what else they're going to, what, you know, what they're going to, what they're going to do when she actually formalizes the study. Cool. We got to wrap this thing up probably. You got like things that you got to be doing. You probably got things too. I got to go to an NHL hockey game. We didn't even talk about Colin Wilson. New fascist science. (laughs) Tell me. Tell me about fascist science. I just don't want to, I just don't want to steal your, I'm trying to pay attention to my, my, uh, we went, that's 54 minutes. It's like. Did we even talk about anything? (laughs) I don't like talking about anything. It's not my preference. I'd rather just go into like the sympathetic neuron thing and just see what pops up. So I didn't finish explaining polyvagal theory though. Could you please? So then you have, so I will. Um, so we have for, first we have to understand the evolution a little bit and the anatomy. So there's a hierarchy of what what we'll use for defense. So now we've evolved to, to use our face for defense first. Like, oh come on, really? I didn't mean that. I'm sorry. And and we'll, you'll you'll smile and you'll gesticulate right. and you'll use your voice. I I'm really sorry. I didn't mean to do that. And then uh, the person escalates it. And then you're like, hey, 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 hey. And you start to run away, mm-hmm. right? So you mobilize. So we, we go from our this uh, cranial interaction, facial muscle vocalization. Then we go into a mobilized state. Maybe we'll throw a punch or two um, or run, which is that sympathetic fight or flight. Or the last place of resort is I'm under life threat. I, t- I recruit my, um, my, v- my dorsal vagus subdiaphragmatic and I, I collapse. Hmm. Um, out of threat or fear or, or shock. So that's the, the hierarchy. And then we actually, in order to get well again, you don't immediately go from your dorsal shutdown into, Hey everybody, I'm fine. You actually have to, you have to move. You have to then go back through the ladder, um, which is a a term that, Oh, Sue, what's her last name? Falzoni. No, not Sue Falzoni. I love Sue Falzoni. (laughs) Um, no, Deb Dana, Deb Dana, uh, co-wrote a book with, with Porges mm. and she talks about the ladder so that you, uh, you have to, to then go back through the ladder, back through the sympathetics, then to get again into that social interaction place. I heard you can jump the ladder through social engagement. Is that, is that not, not a part um, of the, the thinking? There's blended states for sure. 
so there are blended states, like for example, copulation is, you know, deep intimacy is a blended state where you're deeply, deeply relaxed and you're um, completely engaged with your face mm. uh, and voice and, and, and um, I, you know, eye to eye, eye contact and gesture, yeah, right. right? But to have an orgasm, you can't be like running a marathon, <laughs> right? <laughs> Which is sympathetic. I haven't tried, I don't know. Right, but that's fun too, right? Wim Hof told me he's got a, he's, he's uh, at least had an erection inside freezing water. Yeah, that's probably an involuntary, <laughs> you know, I don't know. I, I have to look, but sure, I would believe that. Whatever. There's all sorts of. Um, Sorry. Yeah, I mean, some people, some, in some, you know, for some people, some really unpleasant conditions are erotic. I mean, you look at, you know, S&M and you look at. You know, for some people, though, that that pain pain generating is actually uh, pleasure inducing. So yeah. it's like some of those traditional like traditional feedback loops are co-opted by other um, emotional or uh, conditionings. Yeah. Right. So we've got. The what about so the spinal sympathetic? <laughs> Okay. Sorry. So let's, so let's go. So then there's the, dorsal. So we went from, I have to tell you, so there's the hierarchy and then the next thing is neuroception. Okay. So neuroception. So we did anatomy. Mm -hmm. Talked about the hierarchy, yep. the ladder. I can't wait to re-listen to this, by the way. I'm like really mean that. Well, Continue. better is you should take the breath and bliss immersion where we oh, actually good. spend okay. a day in each of the different zones of vagal domination mm. and um, tie that into respiration. Are you teaching and it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, teaching I'm, it. I'd love to do that. We, and I teach it. There's, we have a team of, of four uh, tune-up trained teachers that lead that as such a special module cool. um, all, over the, all over the world. So I'll be doing it here in March in uh, next year. That's my... I can't wait. Amazing. Okay. So neuroception is a term that Dr. Porch has coined that is our body's ability to sense danger or safety. So we don't know why we get the, the heebie-jeebies around somebody, but you know, our body is detecting threat. Yeah. And a lot of times we just override that and we pretend everything's okay. I think but we're taught to override that. For sure. Growing up. Uh, what's it? Gavin De Becker talks about the gift of fear. You ever read that book? I didn't read it because I was like, I don't want to read that, <laughs> but I have it. I don't have it now, but I've yeah. had it at one point. I was like, I don't think I'm going to do it. But now that you're I read it like 18 years ago or something, my dad gave it to me because it, it, you know, it should help women also to recognize when, you know, there's a predator in the room right? and that they need to take, take action against that intuition. Yeah. Uh, so neuroception allows uh, if we are able to tune into that neuroception and, and detect, uh, you know, we don't know why we're reacting to something, but your body is having reactions all the time. It's not, not everything's cognitive and, yeah. you know, and, and clear. Um, and I think getting sort of getting clear in your organs does help you with that neuroception for sure. Yeah. Um, so being able to detect safety, being able to detect uh, or sensing safety and sensing um, danger is this concept neuroception that he's come up with. And then the last part of, and there's a lot more to each of these, right? These are just like the, the like, this is the, the bullets notes. on the clip notes. This is and the Instagram then, version. Yeah. A little step up. This is like podcast version. The last part Eventually. is co-regulation, is, co is being able to feel safe I in the arms of another is the word to use, or being able to feel safe with another appropriate mammal. We can co-regulate with con with con-specific mammals. Like many people, even people in my family, they don't get along with other people, and you know they have a dog right. as their primary source of co-regulation, of being able to manage their own state. Um, Coupling is extremely common in our society, right? We're a, we're a dyad type of uh, social structure here. Yeah. There's some outliers, you know, in different cults <laughs> where they're not necessarily in dyads. But for the most part, that's been the, the, the biological um, example of this. And we, we, we thrive in community. Yeah. And we thrive when our social engagement system is stimulated regularly so that co-regulation really brings in the ventral vagus um to be just the most important thing to keep 
it's stimulated. Yeah. It seems like, like, like dog packs is like immediate medicine for your nervous system. Like, oh, yeah. Like a bunch of puppies rolling around each other, like us hanging out with your kids. Like they just, they're, totally. they're intuitively connected with all that. So they're just self-tuning mechanisms. Yeah. Because they don't have all the bullshit of like thinking what we're society, <laughs> you know, the society thinks we're supposed to do or whatever. But you look at dogs, you look at kids, they just heal their vagus nerve slash everything else. Yep. They just roll around, they're on the floor, they're touching each other, they'll reach out and grab my beard. and you know, Yeah. But, <laughs> Yeah, and then, That's it. And then <laughs> I I, I, unfortunately, as the parent, I have to pare down uh, for them what is, you know, appropriate and inappropriate, which is really hard. Right. You know, it's like I can't have my kids jumping on strangers' laps. And you know what I mean? There's certain zones of privacy that we have to respect yeah. on a stranger's lap, right? Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm talking about? So yeah, Santa Claus is strange. I was thinking about the other day as I was like eating a salad. I was like, what the f- <laughs> <laughs> what is it <laughs> at the mall? <laughs> what <are you> <laughs> With my Chipotle. Come on. Yeah. Anyways, if you want to be Santa Claus, it's either like a great responsibility and you're like a oh really wonderful, gosh. but if that's like, I don't you're know. You're killing me anyway, right sorry, now. Sorry, I was thinking about it. I had to say it. Uh, sorry. Yeah. So <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Oh gosh, Aaron. A A Aaron. A Aaron. A A Aaron. A A Aaron. So, uh, so is there any other final bits on here? And uh, of so we you didn't mention spinal sympathetic stuff. Well, I did because that's oh, the that's the, the that's the thoracic zone. Okay. So it's right. important to to use your spinal sympathetics because moving is fun. Yeah. And as soon as I'm moving, I'm sympathetically engaged. Right. So sympathetic doesn't always have to mean evil. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. So sympathetic is, is our sense in. of of play. Yeah. Every time you breathe in, you're in the sympathetic um, cycle uh, aspect of your respiratory, of your excuse me, of your of your heart rate yeah. cycle. Um, so that happens every time you breathe in. Every time you breathe out, you're in a more parasympathetic state. Yeah. And then you you know you're scaling up or scaling down depending on the other inputs from the world or the inputs from inside of you and the demands, the stresses of the situation. The stresses being like, oh, I'm working out, or the stresses being like, I'm you know leaning against the couch or I'm 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 feeding my son food. You know, these are all different you know stresses that we encounter. And then we have the social engagement system very active when we're in, in, engaged with somebody else. We have no social engagement happening. We're very little social engagement when we're watching a screen. Mm. And that is, um, that's a, he's, you know, I mean, I think anybody that researches the vagus nerve and, um, you know, is, and watches uh, um, the human interaction whittling down to the level that it is, Cont- it will continue to whittle down, like especially with schools on screens and um, more and more computers in classrooms and less teacher-student interaction. I mean, this is a really, really problematic developmental issue socially. Yeah. Um, you know, back in the day, like 20 years ago, you paid a lot of money to send your kid to a private school where they had computers. Now you pay a lot of money to send your kid to a private school where there are There's no computers. People, yeah. It's bizarre <laughs> what's happened. <laughs> <laughs> right? Because we know, and even all the Silicon Valley like titans, you see these articles come out. I don't let my kids um, have, go on social media. The people that have created social media are like, I don't let my kids go yeah. on that. Steve so Jobs said that about the iPad. <laughs> They're like, how much time is your kids spending on the iPads? I don't let them touch that thing. A couple minutes. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I don't want to warp so his brain. <laughs> because, because we are, we're easy, it's easy for us to um, outsource our own feedback loops into a device. Yeah. And so um, I just love that you wanted to come over and podcast with me. We, I so mean, there better. is a big hill that divides us. It's 32 minutes. <laughs> it could be less in, in better w- traffic conditions. Right. Um, <laughs> but it's much more enriching to, I mean, I, it's like I've watched our bodies get closer and closer over the course yeah, of the, you know, we first we started like we were on these like yeah. pedestals. And yeah. then, you know, like for me, like I like to orient towards another human like it makes yeah, sense my heart my pelvis my brain like but doing it on the computer feels almost like um i mean rape is way too strong of a word but it That's feels it feels <laughs> a little far here it feels a little rapey. <laughs> a little, like, <laughs> on the computer Ener- energetically, <laughs> energetically like it feels like rape in the sense that it's like it feels like it's a taking away like a, doing a computer interview or conversation wherever they okay, at the end of it like i feel like we both feel kind of drained Hopefully, when you come together and you have that social engagement. Oh, interesting, yeah. To me, it's like, hopefully, we're filling each other up. Yeah, 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 And it just happens to be recorded. Yeah. Uh, Like, that's my, if it's not that, then it's like, what the hell are we doing here? 
Yeah, it was like going attending a virtual conference versus going to the co like I went yeah, to Berlin like, last week to do, that. do the fat to go to the fashion <laughs> research congress, and I got to tell you, I must have slept two or three hours each night. I was so upside down, but it didn't matter. I was so yeah enriched by being around my community right. and by nerding out and trying to learn and like just. I'm just so distraught and I make, I make videos. Like I make videos for people to have access to my education. Yeah. Right. And I grew up on fitness videos. Like if it weren't for fitness videos, I wouldn't be the person that I am today. So there is, it's like, yeah, yeah, but well, it's I, one I, of the I, leaves. It's just hopefully it's, it's one, not, of yeah, one of it's the leaves. Yeah. Hopefully it's not the whole it's not tree. The trunk yeah. Of the tree. It's not and the that's roots. what, that's what happens. That's what happens with when we get certain information, we get like leaves of information that like sympathetic states bad for you and cortisol and blue and then, and, or like pronation's bad for you. And then you get like that little blip and then you become obsessed because you don't actually have, understand the trunk or the whole information, but you do know that little leaf, but now you go spinning down this imbalanced pathway because you, you found a leaf. Yeah, that's why you know I saying? like long form teaching too. I mean, my yeah, the nice. breath and bliss immersion is a three day. Actually, I'm going to do it as a five day for the first time at 1440 in um, in the Redwoods in Santa Cruz. Um, Katie Bowman. Well, Katie and I are going to do something in February. Katie oh, okay. and I are doing the first weekend of February. It's almost sold out, everybody. So okay. if you want in on that, okay. it's like I don't know we're when I'm doing. Gonna release this, but. What's that? I don't know when I'm going to release this. Okay, we'll dynamic see. aging with or without joint replacements is that. I'm so excited to share in that format with her what I've learned over the past year. And then this will be jazz. I mean, we've been working on an outline for a while. This is just going to happen. Um, my, my mom was like, I'll come to it when you come closer to New Orleans. I go, Mom, we're not doing it in New Orleans. We're doing it there. That's the date. I don't know when we're going to do this on, a road, on the road ever again. So get there. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. Cool. So what's the best place to point people towards your, what's the, what's the best spot? Tuneupfitness.com. Perfect. Tuneupfitness.com. It'll take you into either the yoga tune-up portal or the role model portal. Uh, we have teachers, over 500 teachers worldwide that teach the work and that are movement geniuses. Uh, find them on the website. I'm on Instagram loud and proud at yoga tune-up. And then we also have a brand page, which is at tune-up fitness on uh, on Instagram and social media, and that's where the giveaways are. So if you're looking for a giveaway, you're not going to find it online because I'm going to post about my kids and my opinions and right. <laughs> my random stuff. And our Tune Up Fitness page is, is you know, it's more businessy and and structured. Sweet. Thank you so much. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah, I really appreciate it. You're welcome. It's like, um, these are the things that I love like thinking about. So it's such a beautiful thing to get to share that. And and you're like you're deeper down the path with a lot of this thing. So it's great. I appreciate you allowing me to kind of like <laughs> peek down those rabbit holes. Yeah, so. I've got two holes I'm digging right yeah. now. Very yeah. big or three. There's three big I holes I'm digging. All right, cool. Yeah. Over yes. now. Normally I do my little my little chop off thing, but my button's so far away. All right, thank you. Wow. <laughs> Online podcast. Thank you guys so much for tuning into that conversation. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. There's some ways that you can support this podcast, one of which you can pick up an Align band, which is a heavy duty resistance band, it comes along with a door anchor and a carrying case, and a video guide on how to mobilize those joints and integrate that body of yours. Really great stuff. You can be found at aligntherapy.com and also on amazon.com. Um, thank you also so much for or utilizing the Amazon affiliate link on the right-hand sidebar of the podcast page. Bookmark that thing. Anytime you purchase some crap on Amazon, purchase that crap through that link. We get a percentage of it. Costs you nothing. And I think that's enough. Thank you guys so much for reviews on iTunes. Thank you for listening. Thank you for supporting. Have a beautiful rest of your day. Pow.